Hi, everybody. Welcome to an English language version of Futurecast. I rarely get to pronounce our name. Futurecast. We're not <laughs> going to deviate Photocast. from that. <laughs> that is weird to pronounce a Futurecast, but I guess it's Futurecast. Anyway, uh, welcome to the episode, uh, our f- the newest episode. My name is Isa Krautio. I'll be your host today. Um, remember to subscribe and comment if this uh, episode raises any thoughts in your mind. And uh, yeah, enjoy the ride. Uh, I'd like to welcome our guest, uh, a former UK undercover drug police, and nowadays you work for Leap UK, advocating and campaigning for drug policy reform. Welcome, Neil Woods, to Futurecast. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, I gave a short intro of you, but mm. do you want to fill anything in? Um, yeah, I'm a I'm a writer and full time activist, but I'm I'm not just part of Leap in the UK. I'm part I'm I'm on the board of the organisation in the United States, and I'm chair of the organisation in the UK and and more broadly in in Europe. Uh, and we're expanding very much uh, in Europe at the moment. And we, I, I represent a large and growing worldwide movement so you know the the things that i say today i will probably give you some uh, some personal experiences and my you know my examples but please do take what everything i i say as being part of a growing movement right okay i think we should start at the beginning um where your career and i guess life started how did you enter the uk drug police or the police in general Oh, well, I mean, I wasn't one of these kids who used to wear a plastic policeman's helmet or run around, you know, wanting to be a police officer. I had no idea I would end up in that direction. Um, I suppose it started for me by, I went to university by mistake. Um, and while I, was, I remember sitting in a lecture thinking, why on earth did I choose to study business studies? Because I found it so boring. So instead of being sensible and finding something else to study, I dropped out. And I was going to go backpacking around Europe, go on a bit of an adventure. Uh, like some friends of mine, but then I saw an advertisement for the police. Couldn't make my mind up, uh, so I flipped a coin and it came up heads, and that's what took me into the to, to the police and, you know, the long journey which brings me to sit here before you today. Um, so I was literally flippant about that. It was, you know, it wasn't a, a lifelong ambition. And then, of course, when I got into the police, I found that I was actually terrible at it. Yep. Uh, I was 19. I was a very young 19, I found out. Um... And I, I was just wasn't wasn't very good at it. I found it really difficult. I found it really difficult to deal with conflict. Um, I'd always been brought up to believe that you could reason with anybody, um, but I, I quickly found out that a drunken football fan will still keep wanting to punch you in the face, no matter how much you want to <laughs> reason with him. So I had some quick growing up to do, and I hated I hated being a uniform cop for the first two years or so. Uh, and in fact, I only I only stayed in for two years, for those two years because I want I was just just stubborn pride. I wanted to prove to myself I could get past that two-year mark and be qualified. Uh, but I stayed in a bit longer and a little bit longer and then got an attachment to the, the drug squad, um, which, again, was a peculiar thing to happen. A young young cops didn't normally get attachments into the drug squad, um, but there was a, a moral panic going on about yeah. crack cocaine. Uh, do you want me to go into go into that or there was a there was an interesting change in drug policy in the UK at that time, wasn't there? It was a complete pivot spurred on by, I guess, American foreign policy. Well, I mean, it, that happened actually um, at the end of the nineteen sixties. So, um, so twenty twenty years, twenty twenty one years before I joined. Okay, so this is different. Police, yeah. so this is the eighties crack uh, epidemic that also yeah, happened the, in the US. Okay, yeah. The, so. Um, the crack epidemic um, happened and the, the British public were terrified by it because right. the tabloid newspapers had been terrifying them for years before we had any on the streets of the UK. You know, there, there was always lurid stories of how crack was destroying America. So as soon as it hit, you know, it, it, it created this feedback loop, which always often happens with drugs, that the public are, are taught to fear it and they put pressure on politics and politics makes some rash decisions and the rash decision they made was to instruct all of the chief constables, all of the police, to make drugs the number one priority. They increased prison sentences, they increased the money going into drugs, and they put a lot of pressure on the police to get results. Mm. And that's where I came in because... You had to recruit new people. Yeah, they wanted to, to, to get younger cops interested in catching mm. people who use drugs and drug dealers. So that's how I got that attachment. It wasn't expected. Um, but one of the drug squad... Uh, 
highly qualified detectives as they were said to me one day, would you fancy having a go at buying some crack cocaine? Mm. Which is quite a surprising question. It's not, I really wasn't expecting that either, but I thought, well, I'm game for anything. Yeah, why not? And I was given a £20 note and I was, uh, there was a hasty um, observation point set up with a camera and I was pointed to this terrace door in the city of Derby. I went to knock on this door. This huge guy entered, uh, opened the door and said, uh, who are you? What do you want? Uh, he says, you're not a fucking student, are you? I hate students. And I thought, <laughs> and at that point I thought, actually, I don't know who I am. I've Did you almost no say, idea. but I know I'm a cop. <laughs> yeah, I know I'm a cop, but I'm not meant to say that. Uh, <laughs> no, what do I it. say? Uh, so, but I thought, that'll do. I'll tell him I'm a student. So I said, yeah, I'm a student. And he says, are you stupid? I've just told you I hate students. <laughs> but he found it funny. And he, he, he sold me some crack cocaine, uh, which hmm. is quite easy. And actually, as I was walking away, he said, hey, you take care now. Don't get yourself arrested, which I thought was really considerate of him. Mm -hmm. And so I went back to the drug squad and I got this little stone of crack. And that changed again, changed my life, really, because the drug squad were thinking, well, we've got we can get easy results here. This is going to take the pressure off if we can if we can do this and keep repeating this. Um, what part of the investigation was the buying of the crack like was it part of a bigger bust or just okay we go knock on that guy's door after 10 minutes and just arrest him i mean they they knew he was a dealer right um but they thought well, let's just try let's just try and knock on his door let's, you, you just go and do it lad um for fun yeah you know just see if we can do it um okay. but the thing is that dealer didn't know he was likely to have a police officer trying to buy off him because yeah. it's kind of that kind of low level undercover work hadn't happened yet in the UK. Yeah. It's I mean, very the, the, new here too as, as a police tactic, I think, in Finland. Like only in the last decade, I think, it started. Oh dear. Yeah, I, I think, I'm not sure, but very Yeah, recent. I mean, it, it has been, you know, in lots of countries, they still don't do it. Yeah. Um, and some countries are just starting to do it. And in the United States, of course, they started doing it in the 1970s. So they've had the subsequent problems for a lot, um, a lot longer. But this guy didn't know. Yeah. Um, but of course he went to prison. And he told all of his all of his companions in there, and quickly, very quickly, everyone knew that the police had a new tactic, which meant that the tactic got instantly more difficult, mm. um, and the marketplace got instantly more violent. So, my so I, I was enrolled into doing this regularly, um, and in no time at all, I was doing no less than a few weeks. And then eventually it was no less than six or seven months at a time because you couldn't just knock on someone's door anymore. You had to get known in a community. And so this low level undercover work, this um, gathering out of evidence by buying it became much more sophisticated and, and actually became much closer to uh, the other higher forms of undercover work. Mm. At what point did you sort of explicitly realize that you're doing undercover work? Uh, I guess the first buy is very, very low level undercover work. It's it's not, you, you don't have to have a legend. You don't have to have a backstory or a false identity. You just, I mean, I guess, yes, because you're a student, but that's it. Yeah. But at what point did it become more explicit? It developed very quickly. I, I, I realized I had to have um, answers to every question. I had to test people's, you know, people's suspicions of me. Uh, tested me and I had to be ready to be tested. So I had to quickly develop cover stories and start using fake documents and all, all sorts of things, really, and did sort of develop the tradecraft as I went on. And for the first four years that I did it, I didn't have any training. So I was literally just making it up as I went along and learning from mistakes and hoping they didn't get me killed. Did you have anyone teaching you? or Not for the first four years. No. Really? Self-taught undercover agent? Yeah. And so I helped, I helped design the training with other people uh, in 1997 when I've been doing it for four years. Um, and at that point, we then brought in what we call level one undercover work. Um, so some of the, some of the experts who did the more high level undercover work to, to come in and teach us. And I got to know one of them really, really well. He's a good friend of mine to this day. And I remember on the first course that we did, he, he we sat down having, having a beer at the end of one of the days and he says, you know, I think you're an absolute nutter. He says, There's, I've, been, I've been doing this work for 13 years. Um, I've put people in, the last person I put in prison was for 13, 13 years as well. Um, and there's no way I'd do what you're doing. Absolutely no way. I think you're absolutely nuts. Too risky. It's, yeah, because all of the people I deal with are businessmen. Yeah. And they're pragmatic and they don't take risks. 
But you're dealing with the nutters. And they're ready you're to dealing with the unpredictable correct. people on the streets. You can't predict their behaviour. You're not. You're not. You can't guarantee your, your own safety. Um, he says you're bonkers. Can you describe what the local organized crime scene and the drug scene is like? What are you up against at this time? At this time, well, I mean, at that point, organized crime was starting to become more sophisticated. And it's actually, it's very important to note, actually, that the general public and even the police don't tend to be aware of how things change over time. And change over time is a very important thing to take notice of in the drug markets and, and what and what we've done to them. But at that at that point in the nineties, um, there was a massive crime wave right across Europe in everywhere except Switzerland, um, and it was increasing crime all the time, including in Finland, including this whole region. So there was there was sort of low level crime and burglaries and car crime, uh, but organised crime was becoming much more sophisticated and separate from that low level criminal activity and there was much more money being made um there was a monopolization happening because of the way we were policing drugs and guns were becoming more prevalent there was uh, warfare between gangs again you know where police disrupt the market you, you get violence so it was a rough time it was a, it was a very dangerous time to be um walking the streets it's quite chaotic yeah okay take us back to the here's about the advancement of your undercover activities and and so how did you what was the sort of next big mission or i guess more long-term mission that you started out with oh god i mean i suppose the longest the first really long-term one was in the city of leicester um and actually that's the first time i bought heroin from a child in the city oh, yeah. of leicester uh he was 16 at the time yeah. um which now in the uk and this is a warning. It's I'm quite old. You. Now in the, yeah, now in the UK, and I'm and I am bringing you a warning from the United Kingdom. This is my warning to the people of Finland. Now in the UK, we have fifty thousand children dealing heroin and crack cocaine. Fifty thousand. Yeah. Um, but back in two thousand, many of them younger than sixteen. Oh, as long as young as twelve. Yeah, they're yeah. recruited and groomed and exploited. They're groomed from the age of twelve. Um, traumatized from the age of age of twelve. Then it was really unusual, and I was a bit shocked, to be honest, that this 16-year-old kid uh, was selling me heroin. Um, but actually, he was a nice kid. And, you know, he had a good sense of humour. I could have a laugh with him. It was quite relaxing. But over the space of that six-month operation, I saw that 16-year-old turn into a terrifying 17-year-old who was using casual violence to build his reputation. I remember near the end of the operation, I saw him, and we were walking along the pavement, and he reached over and casually smash my head into a lamppost just to let me know who was boss. And six months before he wouldn't have done that. He would have joked with me. And, but this is typical because he, his peers were teaching him how to behave, how to survive, how to survive in that marketplace. Because if you're not prepared to be ruthless and use violence, then you're going to lose your territory. Uh, you're going to get grassed up because the weak people get grassed up by the- What does that mean? Um, informed upon. Right. By an, a police informant, you know, snitched on. Snitched on, yeah. yeah. And and people are being snitched on every day. It's the most important tactic the police use is the use of police informants. It's the biggest, most important tactic. But an informant will decide if they think they have to give some information to the police. They're thinking, who am I least scared of? Who is the person that is least risky to me to 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 give information about? So that process of decision making about who's the most dangerous person and who am I safe to give evidence, give information about, that dynamic creates a Darwinian situation on the streets. Mm. So that's why that 16 year old turned into a terrifying 17 year old to avoid being that person who gets snitched on. Yeah, and I, and and I saw that develop, and that's um, you know this is this is quite clear that the current drug policy regime is is changing the personality of our of our young men yeah parents know this they tell their children all the time don't hang out with the wrong type of people even though even even if you tell them as a kid like no i'm not going to become like that i'm not going to become like that like they know everyone becomes a product of their environment almost every yeah. time but still we forget this somehow when we think about drug policy and how, how we moralize uh, a lot of the people involved yeah, absolutely, and that is well put. Actually, people do people do become a product of their environment, 
It's just we have to start being aware of what's created the environment. And it's not actually that complicated. Not really. Um, so that was my first long-term role. But there's all sorts of other things happened um, with that operation. It was the first time I realised I couldn't necessarily trust my colleagues. Things happened in that operation which... which Put me, put me on edge. Um, your your police officer colleagues. My police officer colleagues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I should explain actually that that the systems that are put in place for that kind of un- undercover work. You might be. In, shall I explain? The, like the, yeah, please. Yeah. So it, the whole thing developed from once the training started. Then the, then there was a specialist unit set up called the East Midlands Special Operations Unit (MSU). So we were a regional organisation and. So I was I was an asset provided to the police force, the host police force. But before that host police force would allow to have me as an undercover operative, they would have to put certain things in place. So the team that would support me has to be completely separate from normal policing. They don't they're not based in a police station. They have to be based in a an entirely new location. Mm. Everyone working on the job is not allowed to speak to any cops, any other cops during they have to make up a story of where they've gone. They're not allowed to speak to anyone. So it's completely cocooned from normal policing. So you have uh, a, a tech officer, an intel officer, you have backup, you have the senior investigating officer, you have the, this tight-knit team and everyone has this defined role. The day before I get there, they, they're all given a lawful order. Now, a lawful order is a big deal. If you break a lawful order, you, you're going to be disciplined or maybe even sacked. This is a, you know, And they, they signed receipt of this lawful order. And that lawful order would be, you are not allowed to ask the undercover operative his real name. You are not allowed to ask any personal questions of the undercover operative, like where he's from or anything. And that's to protect me hmm. from corruption. And this cocooned team, which is completely separate from normal policing, this is the systems that were developed. What you, so what you're saying is, if they were aware of your real identity, someone might get a hold of that information within the force yeah. who has a connection to the criminal underworld because of corruption. Yeah, exactly. So the point is, I'm describing all these systems that developed and were put in place. Those systems only exist, only exist, because of the, the, the systematic corruption that the police leaders know is, exists. Otherwise, there would be no need for it, mm. quite simply. Why is, why is that? Well, it's important to point out that, that those systems only exist, only exist for drugs investigations. They're not necessary for anything else. Why do you think that is? Well, it's because, well, two reasons. One, the value in the drug market is enormous. The money. The money, mm. which makes organised crime incredibly powerful, incredibly powerful. But also, the mechanism of policing causes corruption. The mechanism of trying to police drugs cause, causes corruption. Now, I can, I can explain Please that. elaborate, yeah. Yeah, okay. So, here. so, if the police, say in Helsinki, catch a, a dealer or a gang which controls uh, the supply of a commodity, particular commodity in half of the city, say methamphetamine, it, they have a real control over it. They catch them. They catch the gang. Everyone gets caught. The police celebrate. They put something in the newspapers, and you know they sh- they show off how much how many drugs they've they've found. Look at all these big pile of drugs. The gang, or kingpin character, or whoever who is most able and most likely to take advantage of that gap in the market, is someone who controls the other half of the city. Hmm. Now, who I'm, already I'm, has a starting capital. Already has, exactly. Yeah, they yeah. already have the capital. They already have the the team the logistics. Yeah. So they increase their market share. And actually, police informants, the snitches, are often used by organised crime to get rid of the opposition. So monopolies are created by that mechanism of policing because that policing hasn't reduced the size of the market. Mm. It's just changed the shape of it. So, and this and this has been happening since our drug, since the beginning of Prohibition. That gang, that organised crime gang's Share, increase its share of the profits, which means they have more disposable income. And where organised crime has more disposable income, they always, and I mean always, invest it in corruption. Always. 
and by corruption, I mean corrupting the police, the criminal justice system, uh, the prison service, so they can deal drugs inside mm. prison. They always do. Yeah. And they will continue to do so, and they will continue to do so more efficiently. This is really interesting. I don't know where I don't know if you know where you are right now, but you're in the I think second least corrupt country in the world, according to the statistics. But even here, the head of the Finnish Helsinki Drug Police, Jari Arnio, uh, got a ten year sentence. It was a combined sentence of different charges, but uh, because of drug smuggling, his involvement in drug smuggling, he. I think they connected some telephone uh, signal information to his locations and figured out that okay, it's most likely that he's the one. He's he's one of the centerpieces, or at least one of the most central figures in a hashish uh, smuggling ring from the Netherlands to Finland, and he got charged for that. I think because of your first point, yeah, the money. I don't know. I I don't know about the motives, but I mean, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, even here that happens. It's helpful for you to give me that example because this is something that I mean, this is something the public needs to understand. But the problem is that when I start talking about corruption, people don't believe it. It's sad that people feel that it comes across like some kind of conspiracy theory or or something. But, but this is very very real, as you as you, the example you've just given. I remember, um, and people are so they just don't want to believe it. They're so smug and comfortable in their stable democracies. I remember debating uh, the chief, one of the chief of police in, in Copenhagen in, the, in a parliamentary event. I was trying to explain the impact of corruption and the fact that we can't defend against it in the current drug policy regime. We can't. And he just sneered. He said, yeah, but we're not as corrupt as you are in the UK. Mm. And and, it, and it, we've got to not have that approach because the same thing happened in Oslo, in Norway. Norway, yeah. I think they're the, the next least corrupt Probably. After Finland, yeah, Denmark and, and is also head, in the top five for sure. Yeah, and and the head of the head of the drug squad in Oslo got the same, got caught as well. But what that means in Finland is that the next representatives or uh, moles from organized crime in the police won't get caught because they will learn from their mistakes. That's what that means. That corruption has not gone away hmm. uh, because that's the one of the rules of prohibition. Hmm. Corruption will always happen. Interesting. Your second point regarding corruption. Uh, have you seen Sicario, the movie? Denis Villeneuve. I, I have. Yeah, I don't remember it though very much, but I know I've seen it. Yeah, the 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 plot is interesting, and I think this relates to drug policing on a larger scale. I guess I hope that you can illuminate on how much this happens in real life. This whole thing about creating monopolies and how much law enforcement is involved in that process. And there's this one scene where. I forget the character names, but Josh Brolin uh, tells Emily Blunt. Emily Blunt is this outside good oh, cop yeah. who comes into this task force uh, who are sort of trying to figure out and bust some Mexican drug cartel people. And then the spoiler alert, uh, Josh Brolin reveals to her that the secret mission uh, the Mexican government and the US government are doing is that they're trying to create one big cartel like the Medellin times back in the days back when I think Josh Brolin says Medellin refers to a time when one cartel controlled every aspect of the drug trade which provided a measure of order that we could control Mm. and I think people's behavior often reveals more about what they think than what they say so doesn't that sort of imply that a lot of if this happens in real policing that they a lot of the police forces and law enforcement agencies understand that the demand isn't going anywhere, that a way to manage the illegal drug trade and criminality is to kind of live with that, live with the reality of it, uh, but in this dysfunctional way where you're still having this antagonistic, you keep them legal, you keep them outside of lawful control and regulation. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that does very much tap into a sort of passive um understanding of the situation and how to deal with it because it's because so many people just say well it's not we can't change things we can't actually change the laws why we need to do something to adapt to it but you mentioned mexico mexico is a very important uh, case in point to, to to emphasize the point that i just made yeah because there used to be 20 cartels in mexico and now there are three mm. and those three cartels have a bigger gdp than most west african countries and we've created that power by having a war on drugs, yeah. we've thinned out that competition, and they they have a greater share of the of the market. And that corrupting power has destroyed Mexico. 
It's destroyed their security completely. Yeah. 30 years ago, if you committed a murder in Mexico, there'd be a 50% chance you'd get caught and put in jail. 10 years ago, it was 5%. Now, it's less than 1%. If you commit a murder in Mexico, there's a less than 1% chance you'll get caught for it. And that's basic security in a democracy. It's just mm. gone. It's gone. And we've done that by pursuing the war on drugs and creating these, these super powerful monopolies. Yeah. And... They and that the the transnational organised crime of which those cartels are are some of them a part of, that has corrupted entire countries, entire nations. So in the last ten years, we've had the beginnings of narco states. So in West Africa, you've got Guinea, Guinea Bissau, Senegal. They're narco states. They're not run by legitimate government. They're run by transnational drugs or international drugs cram, criminals. It's the wrong people in charge, which means that we can't even fight the climate crisis without solving drug prohibition. Because the fastest deforestation that's going on in the world at the moment is in Guinea, where they had a military coup. And that military coup was just to make the army the biggest drug gang in town. They're not going to stop the deforestation, no matter how many pledges they sign. Because they're not sending anyone to the climate uh, conferences. Well, they, they don't care. It's not on their agenda. No. Their agenda is is led by drug transnational organised crime, right. who actually launder drug money through deforestation, through logging. And illegal mining. This problem is affecting the pl the climate. You know, it's affecting climate justice. Mm. Well, okay. Uh, oh man, I, I I was gonna I was gonna I wanted to go back to your undercover days, but you've opened up such a. Maybe we can put a pin on this yeah, and yeah. talk about your undercover days a bit more, and then get to drug policy reform. Could you describe um, what are some of the most memorable missions and? and operations that you went on during your undercover uh, days? Some of the most sort of uh, defining ones. God, defining, yeah, okay. Um, well, I suppose I could tell you about the first time I thought I was going to die. First time. Sure. Yeah. Um, How many times have you thought that? I actually don't know. Okay. I, I don't know. You lost count. Because uh, I think some of them are, are still uh, blotted out through... Um, CPTSD. Yeah. Uh, but the, the first time, um, it's quite funny, actually. Uh, I, I went to knock on this this uh, dealer's door in Stoke-on-Trent. Now, I'd been buying weights of heroin from this dealer, at not just 10 bags, but decent weights of, of, of him for, for a while. And I got to know him. I thought I, I thought I knew him fairly well. But he answered the door to me this day and he put a samurai sword to my throat. And he looked at me and he said, you, you're fucking drug squad. You fucking DS. I know you are. You DS man, and he's getting really angry, and his face was red, and this he's shouting at me, and this saliva's splashing into my face as he's getting angrier and angrier. And I'm thinking, I'm going to die. I can feel this cold steel, and I'm going to die. And then I heard this laughing from this woman, and this woman popped her head out behind him and said, "I thought he was. I thought he said he was going to be one. Then I thought he was going to say he was." And she was laughing, and then he started laughing. I thought this is this is really strange, but then I realised they were joking with. They were winding me up. How long did that take? That the the holding the sword to your. It was. It seemed to go on forever. To be honest, it's certainly long enough for me to conclude I was about to die. Anyway, um, but anyway, I said oh, I don't mean to bother you, man. I just want like a a wait. And anyway, um, he sold to me. He sold to me four. It was in four bags. Um, I think I think maybe he just wanted to try out his new sword. I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> you know, he's just <laughs> look what we're going to do with this. Um, but it is sort of typical of the sort of uh, chaotic behaviour which creates reputations, and these kind of unpredictable reputations is what protects people like that. Anyway, I was putting I put the four bags of heroin in my uh, in my cigarette packet as I'm walking away from this door, and I look up and there's a knife. Pointing into my groin, sorry, into, pointing at my stomach, and I look up and there's this guy about trying to rob me. This is the same day. Same day. I just turn round, like a couple of meters away, four or five meters away from the house. I just bought the heroin, and someone's trying to rob me at knife point for the heroin I just bought. And I thought, no, no, I've just gone too, through too much for this heroin, and you're not having it. So I started to walk walk backwards, and then I just went really quick. And I move quicker than him. And I'll never forget what he said. He says, no, no, just come back a minute. <laughs> I'm thinking, uh, 
no, actually, <laughs> no, I won't. <laughs> and I ran behind this car and it was a bit like, a, you know, you play chase as a kid, you know, r- r- shuffle one way and shuffle the other around this car and he's trying to chase me with his knife. And then anyway, I sprinted away and I was able to run m- much faster than him. In fact, he didn't run very far at all. But but yeah, took about out of the frying pan and into the into the fire. Um, yeah, that was a quite a day. Why didn't you, since you're an undercover cop, why didn't you give him your, your heroin? Um, Not to question your uh, that horrible day, but well, two reasons really. Yeah. Two reasons. One thing I did very early on is I, I, com- I, is you never, you never show out, you never um, step out of your role, ever. Hmm. And I, f- from the way I felt, is I, I would the behavior, my behavior would be to protect that. Yeah, you know, and and. Um, I'd gone through a lot to get the money together for it, you know, um, and I wouldn't give it up so easily. Same type of stubbornness, maybe that kept you in the force. Yeah, maybe. yeah, I I am stubborn even when when things hurt. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, but that's just just no, I didn't even consider for a moment letting him have it. To be honest, I just thought absolutely no way. <laughs> I'm just not after what I've been just been through for it. How much did you um, internalize your characters? your undercover legends, how much did they become a part of your identity? Well, I mean, it's important to say that when you're working undercover, you're not an actor. And I don't have the skills of an actor, and I wouldn't pretend to have. And when I was teaching other undercover cops, this is a very important point to make. Actors are highly skilled individuals who can play a completely different person on a stage for a couple of hours or in a scene for a film. We can't do that. We have to. We have different skills, and we have to be a different version of ourselves. And the closer you are to yourself, the mm. easier it is. So I didn't really internalize any dramatic change in character, like some method actor. You know, I didn't sort of like change um, my my basic personality or or behavioral behavioral traits. It was more adapting to fit in. If that makes sense. So yeah. quite you build quite on what you have. We we've had yeah. um, another undercover Finnish undercover police officer here. He was also infiltrating. In drug gangs, I think in Spain, uh, mostly. Um, not sure, but uh, I mean, definitely in Spain. And he also said the same thing. The part of the legend building and the character building is is you build up on who you already are. There's yeah. no point in trying to create a um, a completely different identity because then you run the risk of getting caught. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You, you you don't. Unless you're an actor, you you don't have the skills for that anyway, yeah. and that's important to to know that. And actually, when I in, on courses, I used to fail people who thought they could act. Um, it's it's not it's not what you need to be doing. So I didn't really internalize anything particularly, um, and the thankfully I had a good memory for legends and details and things, so I could stand the test of questioning, and I could remember the same things over a, a sort of a seven month operation. So it wasn't too too difficult really okay um could you um could you talk to me about the burger bar boys yes certainly um hmm, by the by the time i um (laughs) by the time i was about to do the operation for the burger bar boys I'd, i'd actually given up undercover policing uh, because I was finding it just too emotionally stressful, just mm. too too upsetting. Um, but I got a call from from the detective sergeant planning the operations, and he said, Woodsy, we need you to come back and do this operation because this gang are even worse than the last lot that you dealt with. These um, This gang called the Burger Bar Boys, and I'm, I'm told sometimes if I'm in different countries that that's a very British name for a, for a gang. Yeah, it's, it's almost fake. Yeah, almost fake. Yeah, the Burger Bar Boys. But yeah, it's, de- it's definitely the name. Why, where did that come from? Did they did it have anything to do with a burger bar? Yeah, there was a there was a burger bar on a place where they used to hang out in in um, South Birmingham, um, and it's where they used to hang out. And they they in, they had and some infamous rivals called the Johnson Crew. Um, also very British. Also very British. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it was explained to me that this gang was even worse than the last lot that I dealt with. Um, and I was shown intelligence about their behaviour and they were using, they were gang raping people. They were using extreme sexual violence as part of their reputation building. And it was an example of, that I was becoming increasingly aware of that with every passing year I was doing this work, 
the the sort of reputations and the profiles of people was getting more and more violent all of the time. They were doing the normal kind of gangster stuff like kidnappings and shootings and, and maimings. In fact, one of them was implicated in seven different murders in Birmingham and he was uh, apparently the person who supplied two machine guns which, uh, in, which was used in the murder, a very famous murder in the Midlands of uh, in, in the UK to young women called Letitia Shakespeare and Charmaine Harris, which had happened just a few months before this operation. They tried to get other undercover cops close to them and they'd not managed it. So by this point, I'd become sort of a troubleshooter. You know, I ended up getting put on the more, di the more difficult jobs. And so I was talked into it. I thought, well, I've got to have a go at catching these people. But I think looking back, I was already... Starting, I was already traumatised. I was already starting to get the first signs of my PTSD. I didn't realise that at the time. So I was already struggling when I went into this operation. Well, how did you know this? If you don't mind me asking. Um, in retrospect, looking back, it, it was everything was much more difficult. I used to find it easy, uh, but it was like I had to force myself out in the morning. You know, I had to force myself to go through the rituals of the... Uh, recording of my evidence with the camera equipment and all everything was just harder and I had to actually steal myself and push myself out to go out on, on the job um and, and yeah I was just feeling more jaded but I kept you know but I kept going so I went into I went into the town Northampton and I realized I would have to really work hard on a legend so I looked for some really vulnerable people and that's what I did I would look for the most vulnerable people and the reason for that is vulnerable people are the easiest to manipulate uh, and if that sounds ruthless well of course it's ruthless that is the nature of that work you know if it's just started here in the last few years in Finland be be very clear this is ruthless work so the vulnerable people people who are using drugs problematically really problematically they tended to have the the connections and you know because they use more drugs. And it took me weeks to develop and manipulate this couple. Um, I went shoplifting with them, and which is great fun. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I, I got to know all the traders in stolen property, the people who would buy bottles of spirits, the people who would buy baby clothes. There's always a market in baby clothes, you know, children's clothes, because they grow up so fast. Yep. Um, so I'd, I'd find all these people who would buy it and develop that reputation. And so I was a believable person when I got that introduction. And... When I got into I'll never forget being introduced to the gang because I got taken to this snooker club, which is where they were holding court at the time. And I got taken into the gents' toilets, quite a large space. And one of them came in, opened the cubicle, stood on the toilet, closed the door, and then looked over the top of the door and said, what's this? And the moment he said that, the door burst open and four hooded figures came in and they started walking around me, walking around me. And every so often, one of them would headbutt me. I presume it's a head anyway. On the side of the ear, it would really hurt. And then mm. another one would jo jostle me, and another one would punch me in the ribs. It's a hard bone. Yeah, yeah. Hard bone, yeah. Yeah. And it, and it, it was just increasingly becoming more violent, and I was just thinking, oh, I, knew, I knew the reputation of these people. I just thought, I'm not going to get out of here in one piece. I'm not. At the moment I was thinking that, with him questioning me and questioning my mate as well, and he said, oh, all right then, what do you want? And I very politely said, I'll have one and one, please. Meaning a 0 0.4 of crack and a 0 0.4 of heroin. So I gave him my 40 quid, took the took the drugs and then got, we exchanged phone numbers. So all that weeks of work, I was in with them then. I was actually dealing directly to them rather than their runners and lesser people that I had been dealing with. So I spent the next few months gathering evidence of conspiracy against the whole um the whole gang. And whenever I was in their company, I always felt in threat of immediate violence. Always. It, it, much more so than, than than other gangs. I remember actually months into it, I'd start, started wearing a camera because you don't wear a camera early on because there's an increased risk of you being searched. So once you think that you're comfortable with someone, you can start gathering sort of visual evidence, that kind of thing. And... Um, I just remember one day them looking at me and I'm thinking, I don't like the way they've looked at me today. I don't like this. And so the next morning, just before the briefing, I was thinking, shall I put the camera on? I'm thinking, nah, I'm not doing it today. I'm not wearing it today. 
good decision because when I went out to meet them, there wasn't just one or two of them, there was four of them. And I was put in these, in, I think it was a van, uh, this sliding door off vehicle anyway. And um, I was taken not far to this um, wooded area near to like a park in the centre of Northampton. It's called the race course. Not entirely sure exactly where, but it was near that race course. Um, and they said, right, strip. You're five O, man. You're fucking five O. You're heat. And five O is like a slang term. It Cops. comes from it comes from Hawaii five O. And I remember looking at yeah. it and thinking, you're not old enough to have seen Hawaii five right. O. Get the that's my that was what I was thinking. And, and I you think know, it's right. I don't know when this was, but we know it from GTA. I think. Right. Oh, or movies. Oh, it's just right. become a right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The maybe, oh, no, I didn't know that. I think so. I don't I'm know not, if it's GTA. I it's a game person. Maybe that's where they got it from. Maybe. Yeah. Anyway, they said you're five O man. You're heat. You're stripping. You're wearing a wire. And I'm thinking, I'm not doing that. And then one of them lifted up a t-shirt and showed me a gun tucked into the top of his tracksuit bottoms. Now, the weirdest things go through your head or go through my head at times of extreme adrenaline. Because I remember looking at that gun thinking, how are those tracksuit bottoms holding that gun up? That was what, was what went through <laughs> my head. But, you know, I'm thinking, yeah, I'm going to have to do as I'm told here. And yeah, it was humiliating. It yeah. was absolutely horrible. And I don't really know if they actually did think I was a cop or really that I think maybe they just wanted to humiliate me, make make it quite clear who was boss, you know? It was time to do that with me. Um and it yeah, so that was a most unpleasant experience. But you know, as a as I was walking away, that's that's what they'd sold to me. I was walking away, the correct procedural thing to, to for me to do as a cop would be to go straight back and report what had happened. I didn't do that because we hadn't finished gathering the evidence and I knew that the boss of the operation would, would follow procedure and send it upstairs straight away and the job would end there and then. Yeah. And that that gun would have been stashed straight away after that. They're not going to have been walking around with that all day. That'll be gone. So we wouldn't recover it anyway and we would not gather sufficient evidence against them. So I'm thinking, I've got no option here. I've, I'm not reporting that. I'm not writing that up because we won't catch them. So, um, you know, and I'd learned that reality several years before. Um, so I had to carry on and I did an evidence drop and then I'd bought some, I bought something else later on that day and, and just, and just carried on. But, um, at the end of seven months, uh, we did have enough evidence against them all. Um, and actually, it was an extraordinary amount of evidence. We got cons evidence of conspiracy against the six main gangsters, the main six main targets, but other, also 90 other people involved. 90 sex workers, runners, people who were stashing for them, all these people who they'd really exploited and brutalised into being part of their gang, but it was one gang. And there I was knew like a hiring process. They were manipulated into Oh, yeah, the, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I got evidence against the lot. So from my point of view, this is fantastic. I thought we we're going to catch everybody. Mm. This is going to be amazing mm. because there's no one else to meet. I've caught everyone, everyone. So there was hundreds of cops brought in from surrounding police forces, hundreds. It's a massive operation. And when the dust settled, I got, I spoke to the intel officer who was responsible for, you know, keeping his ear to the ground and, and, and finding out what happened. And he said to me, yep, we've managed to interrupt the drug supply in Northampton for a full two hours, two hours, seven months of work, being quite convinced I was going to die on multiple occasions. The resources, the sheer scale of the resources, it's unimaginable. You almost dying. Yeah, almost dying, yeah, for the sake of interrupting that drug supply two hours. for two hours. Now, I'd, al I'd already been sort of paying attention to the, or rather I was already aware of doubts, big doubts, from time and time again, for all sorts of reasons about the rights and wrongs of what I was doing, but I was always fired up by the covert policing world to just keep keep chasing the next gangster, keep chasing him. But you can't ignore that reality because I don't know for certain that it was the Burger Bar Boys ri uh, classic rivals, the Johnson Crew, that took up that opportunity. I don't think it was actually, but you can sort of picture the scene, can't you? They're all sat around, and one of them comes in and says, "Put the call in, boys." We're going to make a fortune. Guess what the cops have done for us? It's amazing. They've caught the Burger Bar boys. 
And that's what you do every time. You make someone's day. You make someone celebrate. Someone else is going to make loads of money from that. And there's a, there's a word that British police and Canadian police, I don't know if they do it here, if there's an equivalent translation, but there's a, a word that the British police use when they have a successful operation like this. Uh, and they say, we, we have successfully disrupted organised crime. Yeah. We have a duty to disrupt organised crime. And they say that without any irony at all. That word disrupt actually comes from, from as far as I can gather, has its origins in a military tactic to uh, deal with an insurgency. You disrupt the activities of an insurgency. To to that's how you, that's strategically what you do. And police are treating the drug dealing market as an insurgency, but they're not insurgents. They're not terrorists. They're just people within a business structure. So if you use that word, disrupt, in a business academic sense, it means something very different yes. and more appropriate because any business academic will tell you that if you want to create market growth, you disrupt that market. You disrupt a market to create opportunity. Yeah. And this is what the police are doing every single time they have a successful drugs operation. You've essentially are, bankrupted competition. Yeah, but you, you create opportunity, you create growth. You, you, you quite often increase consumption because where people people either compete with violence or they'll compete with with price drops, with a price war. So pre, price, the price will go down after a big bust. Yeah. And this is... Um, so you kind of uh, mentioned what I wanted to go into, which is your... I guess what, is, what has led you to where you're now, uh, campaigning for drug policy reform. Um what were, apart from this, what were some of the other sort of defining moments and insights and realizations that made you realize that this isn't productive? Yeah, well, I mean, I suppose there's, there's quite a lot, but I suppose the most important one, and we've covered a lot of this already, uh, is um, the operation in Nottinghamshire. Now, in Nottingham, there was a lot of pressure on me to find out information about the certain gangs because there was warfare going on between this gang called the Bestwood Cartel, run by Colin Gunn, and just about everybody else. And there were shootings happening all the time. It was in the national press and even the national news uh, at the time. Nowadays, people have become numb to it and it doesn't even reach the newspapers. But then it was a big deal back in about 2003. So I managed to get introduced to um, this particular lieutenant of this, of this gangster, and I remember when I, was, when I was introduced to him, I went to meet him and he turned up in a car with his son, with 12-year-old son. Are we, we're okay for time? Yeah, we're okay. Just checking. Um, with his 12-year-old son. And his 12-year-old son was wearing the same tracksuit, the same trainers, the same shaved head, the same gold necklace. He was like a mini me. And this gangster had obviously brought his son along to teach him the ropes and he was showing off a bit to his son. So he opened the car door and he put a knife into my groin which mm. is unsettling. Yeah. Uh, really unsettling. Never had that happen to me, but I no, can imagine. You don't, I wouldn't recommend it. Not gonna. Um, and he interrogated me while he had this knife pressed into my groin. Um, so, but, you know, eventually he sold, he sold me the drugs and he went. So that was a, that was a stressful day. And then I had a morning, early morning start the next morning and we had a briefing, but two of my team had gone off sick. So there was two new cops brought in that I'd not met before. I didn't like that to start with. I didn't like, I didn't want my team shaken up. That's unsettling. Met the first one, shook his hand. I had no problem with him. The second one, I shook his hand and the hairs just stuck up on the back of my neck. There was something completely wrong about this guy, instinctively. Now, when you've been working undercover for four and a half months at that point, you know, your senses are really fine tuned. You're very, very hypersensitive to nuances of body language. And I knew this guy wasn't right. I knew it. So I said to the guy running the operation, I said, look, boss, I can't have this guy. I'm not having this guy in the team. I'm not going out there. And he was great. He said, fine, we'll just exclude them both. They, they've just been told to come here. They know nothing about the job. They've not been briefed. Uh, we'll just get rid of them. They can park up at the edge of town. I was reassured. I put it out of my mind. A year later, the Bestwood cartel was brought down by a brilliant operation by Nottinghamshire Constabulary. And at that point... It was found that that police officer that I'd taken exception to was an employee of Colin Gunn. He was part of the gang. 
but he was paid to join the police. He was paid to join. And by the time I'd met him, he'd been in the police for seven years. He was paid £2,000 a month on top of his police wages, plus bonuses for good information. Now, he was caught by luck, really. And in the debrief for that, senior cop said to me, look, Woodsy, we know this happens. Of course we know this happens. With this much money involved, how can it not happen? Now, I know we've already discussed corruption uh, earlier on, but I just wanted to emphasise that example, one of my examples where I've come across corruption, because it's important to note how sophisticated this corruption is and, and the fact that they even use sleeper corrupt cops to corrupt other corrupt cops, to corrupt cops by finding something against them, to blackmail them, to influence them, so that the established person is always safe and they are merely used to turn other ones. It's really sophisticated how this happens around the world, really sophisticated, and we cannot defend against it in the current drug policy regime. I know I've said that already, but mm. forgive me for emphasising the importance of that. No, of course. What about the drug user themselves? They, they are the essentially the people who are financing the entire market. That's where the demand comes from. That's where that's the that's the entire that's where the money comes from, basically. Yeah, of course. Yes. How do you think? Uh, how has your perspective changed? Obviously, it's the the drug user isn't one type of archetype. There's many types of different people who do drugs and different types of drugs for different reasons, but. What what mis misconceptions uh, did you have, or do people have, and, and how have they changed during your career? Yeah, well, it's, my my view has changed drastically, drastically from the young man, from the prejudiced young man I was, uh, to 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 the person I am now. And I'm very glad that you made the point that people use all sorts of different drugs in different ways. And actually, ninety percent of drug use is non problematic at all. Uh, and the ten percent that is problematic, it's a sliding scale. People need some people need more help than others, so this view that all drug use is problematic is 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 a nonsense, and it's very problematic propaganda. But the view I had was that, if, particularly of heroin and crack, it, if someone had a problem with it, then it, they were stupid enough to have tried it. And it's their fault. It's uh, a moral failing. Yeah, and it, yeah, and and they didn't have the 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 willpower to get out of it. That's their fault. Mm. You know, I was just so judgmental. But then I got to know people who were using heroin or crack problematically. And, you know, I spent a long time getting to know these people. So I learned how to fit in. I, I, I learned to weaponize empathy, um, you know, to, to, to find out about them, but use it to manipulate them. But I was, I was learning and I realized that every single person, every single person who was using drugs problematically was self-medicating for emotional pain, for emotional trauma. And almost all of it was through childhood, either neglect, or sexual abuse or physical abuse. Like like someone said to me, yeah, my dad used to hit me, but only when I deserved it. He was using heroin problematically. Uh, a young woman called Uma said to me, yeah, I can stop using heroin. And I do every few weeks so to bring the tolerance down to make it cheaper for me. But the trouble is once I've stopped heroin for a couple of weeks, I become suicidal because I remember the feeling of my uncle's fingernails when he used to sexually abuse me as a little girl. So for her and many people like like her, like her, it's a pragmatic decision to stay on heroin because it's a very very effective painkiller of emotional pain. Right, it's a dysfunctional yet effective behavioral pattern. Yeah, absolutely. Most yeah. drug use is rational, even when it appears not. Not. Yeah. At least it's not random, and this is where people, I think mistake. Irrational behavior is not random behavior. Exactly, exactly. And we have this ridiculous dialogue. I, mean, I used to believe it. I mean, I, I remember Nancy Reagan, the, the wife of the former president on TV saying, one smoke of crack cocaine and you're addicted for life. No, no, you're not. I mean, I believed it as a young man, but it's utter nonsense. You have to, there's a reason if someone is addicted to something, a reason. I mean, if you'll see, you see someone struggling with heroin or crack or methamphetamine, mm. you should be saying, what happened to you? What happened to you and how can we help you? Not judge them for for their behaviour and criminalise them. Now, obviously, I've, I, I realise this now, but I've been on a long journey um, and, and I've had to critique my own thinking. But I would just ask that everyone else there, critique your own thinking as well. This, the evidence is very clear 
the evidence supports my view here. Academic evidence supports my, what I'm saying. It's not just my observation. That's what I was going to ask, because if I'm a policymaker or a voter and I'm listening to this skeptically, I, I might be sympathetic to your anecdotes and, and I might be trying to find ways, even very well-reasoned ways to sort of poke holes and be like, not everyone who's abused is using heroin. And there are ways in which you can get physically addicted to drugs, even if you're not traumatized. There are mechanisms within the substances. All of this is true. But how does the larger pool of evidence, um, what, what kind of a drug policy reform do you think that, that the, the larger scale evidence, the academic evidence supports? Well, there's a wealth of evidence. There's, there, are t there are 20 academic studies that I'm aware of uh, that, that come up with the same figures in relation to specifically heroin, that two thirds of problematic heroin users are self-medicating for childhood trauma. And that childhood trauma includes sexual and physical abuse and neglect. Those studies, 20 studies, mm. um, and they come up with the same figures. And the fact that it's the same figures is quite fascinating. The, the other third of them, Many of them are uh, self-medicating for undiagnosed mental health conditions. They're struggling to deal with undiagnosed neurodiversity or, or other adult-caused trauma that they're self-medicating for. And yes, there is a chemical relationship with opioids in the fact that you can have a withdrawal, but that is not what is causing the addiction. And the evidence is very clear on that, that there, there is an extraordinary wealth of evidence to support that. But there's also... We shouldn't just look at the academic evidence. We should look at history. We should look at how things have changed. And the UK is a perfect example of where we should look at change because there used to be two schools of thought internationally. There was the American model of drug control and the British system. And the British system, capital B, capital S. And they were opposing worldviews. Uh, the British system meant that if you developed a, a problem with drugs, you went to a doctor and you got help. That was the foundation principle of the British system. And it, what, what that meant for heroin or cocaine, that if you became addicted to them, you would be given a clean supply of those drugs. You would be given that drug supplied by a doctor. And that meant we didn't have a heroin problem. We didn't have it because organised crime wasn't involved. There wasn't any incentive to find vulnerable people and sell them heroin. There's no incentive because doctors were controlling it. What about, the, what about the, what someone might say Actually, what someone did say when I asked for questions uh, to this episode is like, how did that affect the crime associated with drug use? A lot of people finance their drug use by doing other types of crimes. And and they, they usually say that, well, how would legalization affect this? What would you say to that? Well, I mean, that's a broad question because I'm specifically talking about heroin here, which is a, yeah. which is a particular problematic uh, drug for crime. It's very different to regulating cannabis, of course. But sure, since yeah. in terms of heroin, there, well, there was no crime associated with the drug. At all, at all under the British system. Because why would there be? It was provided free from a doctor. So there's no crime, no need to commit crime for it. And you've, if you're if it's provided by a doctor, you've not got this daily fight to try and find money for it. So you've got space in your life for other things. You have a chance at healing. And people did heal. You didn't so, get a job, maybe. Yeah, well, the people were functioning. At the yeah. end of the 1960s, when the British system was finally shut down by the, by the um, imperial might of uh of american international policy um and it was shut down because we owed the united states so much money after world war ii which gave which made them a true superpower and they told us what to do so when the british system was shut down there was 1046 heroin consumers in the uk 1046 the number was falling in less than 15 years from the moment that market was handed to organized crime we had 300,000. 300,000. Very clear cause and effect. Mm. Because it's it's in the interest of organised crime to find those vulnerable people. It's in the interest of organised crime to put pressure on user dealers to find more customers. And emotionally pain, people in emotional pain will will find that comfort. So it's a cause and effect. That's and an we've insane number. Monster. Yeah, it is. It is. And that's a piece of history. Now, we had a, a slight... Um, Revisit of the British system just in the in Merseyside near Liverpool between 1982 and 1994. One doctor was doing it, and all of his patients, his sex workers, stopped doing sex work. His his people got people got jobs because they were having regular prescriptions and they didn't need to commit crime. They were all well. No one died at all for those 12 years. But then the doctor doing it did a 60 minutes documentary in the states because he wanted to evangelise about this. He wanted to explain the good news that we can save lives. 
the American government then got in touch with the British government and said, what are you doing in your country? And shut it down. The next day, he was shut down. And not only was he shut down, he was blackballed. He couldn't get a job as a psychiatrist in the UK. He had to emigrate to New Zealand. It's called John Marks. So it was all stopped. Within two years, most of his patients were dead. 40 people died, just like that, because the medicine was stopped. They were back on the streets, back exploited by organised crime. But the evidence that he collated yep. um, got onto the desk of the new health minister in Switzerland, the brilliant Ruth Dreyfus. And she took that evidence to persuade the Swiss public of the way to go. And so that year in 1994, Switzerland started prescribing heroin like the British system. And as a result, they got rid of their heroin problem. They got rid of it. Their burglaries dropped 50% through the 1990s at a period when every other European country was having an epidemic of crime. They cut their crime, they saved lives, and now they don't have a heroin problem because the state's in control, it's regulated. And Switzerland isn't the only country, as far as I'm aware, in Europe with this system. The Netherlands looked at the Swiss evidence and took a pragmatic view and adopted the same policy. And now they don't have a heroin problem. Now, I know heroin isn't particularly a problem in Finland. It's no, we have Subutex. We have buprenorphine. Yeah. yeah. Um, but where you've got synthetics like buprenorphine, fentanyl's going to follow. Mm. You've got fentanyl in Estonia. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's the main opioid in Estonia. You need to take control away from organized crime. That's how you save lives. Take control. So what is your larger drug policy uh, reform? Uh, so I, in Finland, the discussion is is still, I mean, we're still debating whether or not we should have these safe rooms for injecting. And that is a controversial topic yet here. So like we're, we're quite far away from, from Switzerland in 1994. Um, in many ways, perhaps unfortunately, because I mean, drug deaths, especially among the youth here in Finland, rapidly growing and there doesn't seem to be a solution um, offered by mainstream politicians at this time no well i mean we, we well we did the event this week um yeah in switzerland and i'm hoping that will be a seed of influence to to, to to spark this debate in the right direction in in finland but i mean we don't have safe consumption in the uk either we we we, we, we tend to we call them overdose prevention centers we yeah. don't have them yet either um, and it's terrible because we have the highest drug deaths as well. We have horrendous drug deaths. But, you know, the evidence is there from around the world. In Spain, they have them. So their drug deaths have gone down uh, most countries in Europe, Netherlands. The Netherlands are actually closing many of theirs because they don't have the drug problem anymore. That They need them. They're actually shutting them down because they're not having the drug deaths. Hmm. We should just, why don't we just look at the countries that are doing it better and and use their evidence? It's not so complicated um but our position on on if, you, if, if you're asking that our position yeah. the position of the law enforcement action partnership which is my organization is that we need to take legal control of all of the drugs all of them but we will regulate those drugs according to the relative risks so we follow the evidence for each one so legal regulation for heroin is as, as i would already as i've already described Legal regulation for cannabis is different, entirely different. Uh, and thankfully, now we have some examples around the world of how it's done well and how it's done not so well. And we can develop our own regulatory systems to suit our our own um, style of politics. And I'd way be interested in hearing more about that. What, what, what is a good regulatory system for cannabis and what is not? Right. So the United States has... Um, many states who have legalized adult use cannabis mm. and some of them have done it terribly because they've just allowed the free market to take over and that doesn't cope with the harms public health harms california is the is a terrible example of how they do it um there's no reg there's branding there's advertising there's no regulatory control of the uh, adequate ready control of the strength of the products but most importantly there are people in prison in california for for dealing cannabis and even now, there's a legal market in, in California. That's pretty Which crazy. is outrageous. Yeah. It's outrageous. The better models in the United States have actually taken time to invest in the communities that have been most damaged by the drug laws. So in New York State, for example, they have grants 
for people who have had criminal convictions, for people who are not white, for the for the uh, communities of colour that which have been drastically met, way more affected by these laws than white than white people. They're investing in those communities and allowing those people to take part in the business boom that the cannabis industry creates. So those are good examples. It should be done with social equity. It should be done with attention to social equity. And that's why I'm actually hopeful in Finland, because you have a tradition of considering social equity. You have a tradition of good social policy. You have a, a tradition of good regulation. I mean, you've got the best regulation of alcohol in Europe. Significantly less people die here from alcohol than the UK. Significantly less. And that's because you've got better regulation. So Finland is a natural leader in this. You know, when the politics starts to take shape and you start to have the serious mainstream debate, this is where I would be looking for, to for leadership, where we are now. Um, because, you, you know, when you look at housing first policy that you have, that's being copied all across Europe. You know, there's, there's some carefully considered social policies that come, come out of Finland. So you should you should be leading on it, really. But then all the other drugs, they should be regulated according to relative harm. So MDMA, for example, is the perfect example of a drug that's not banned because it's dangerous. It's dangerous because it's banned. All of the deaths associated with MDMA that I'm aware of have been because it's not regulated, because it's not MDMA, it's got something else in it, or because it's a tablet that's four or five times too strong, or it's an underage person who's been able to get it because... Drug dealers in the illicit market, they don't ask for photo ID. They don't care how old you are. And we know now, we have evidence from the United States, from the legal cannabis markets, that we know legal regulation protects children better than prohibition because the underage consumption of cannabis in those countries has gone down. Mm. And drug policy, if, if it should be about anything, no, nothing else, it should be about child protection. And, and that's why it needs to become a mainstream political topic because a lot of people have at least an intuition that if you free up or if you legalize substances that the i mean the usage rates would go up what do you think about that well that, that's not necessarily true and, and it's different different for depending on the drug and for heroin we know it goes down we yeah. know once you take control of the opioid market consumption goes down we know that yeah on the record if heroin is ever legal i'm i don't think i'm trying heroin well no no but but that's the case but you wouldn't be able, it would be too difficult as a regulation system for you. You wouldn't be able to casually right. try it because there's no there's no gangsters peddling it to you. Right, exactly. Because once you take control, you've you've got a grip of who the who the who the customer base is and how to look after them. And if you look after them, the the overall numbers will go down over time. We know that from Switzerland and the British system, whatever. For the for the other drugs, you know, you have to you have to think about the numbers. And politicians will say it's important how many people we have to reduce the number of the people using drugs. No, we don't. We need to reduce the number of people dying from drugs. Abusing. Well, we just need to, I mean, what? we need to give harm reduction advice. Right. We, need, we need to teach people how to use things more safely. We need to teach them um, the, the things that's going to hurt them. You know? Right, like with alcohol, it's easier because there's no moral stigma about it. I mean, if every single adult Finn had a glass of wine every evening... Is that worse than 10,000 people dying from alcohol every year in, in Finland? Like these two worlds. There's absolute, there's on an absolute scale, there's more alcohol users in, in yeah. world number one. But I would still, I think, I don't think people would disagree that world number two is much worse, where people are dying of alcohol. Yeah, exactly. And we have that situation now. People are dying, for goodness sake. Yeah. We, there are evidence based ways to prevent people dying and or becoming more harmed. But I mean, I would make the point that anyone who wants a, any drug they want can get it. Mm. That's important to note. So why would it? Why would the market increase? But even if, right? I mean, there are huge numbers of people using MDMA already. Even if, um, because of a growing interest in electronic music, the dance music culture, even if legal MDMA meant there was an increased number of people using it, I don't care. I really don't, because there wouldn't be anyone dying from it. And do I care if someone takes MDMA and goes dance, dancing to some repetitive beats? Do I really care? Is that something to form a moral judgment on? I don't think it is, really. Um, but I don't think use would particularly go up. But increased use without harm is not a problem. So we need to readdress what metrics we use. We can save lives. What else do we need to say? 
we can save lives and there's evidence ways to, to do that. Yeah. It is really weird when you bring up alcohol as a, as a parallel example, using these same metaphors and how if you switch that to another substance, the logic completely gets flipped around and people seem to sort of lose their minds and not realize that the same logic applies to basically every single substance, doesn't it? Exactly, exactly. And actually, it's, alcohol is important because there is also very good evidence that alcohol is by a long way the most dangerous of all the drugs we're talking about. Mm. Much more dangerous, much more toxic, more dangerous to the individual, more dangerous to society, more dangerous to family cohesion. Um, it's a big driver behind domestic violence. You can't say that about the other drugs. Mm. It's a very, very dangerous and toxic drug. Um, and we are, and in Finland, you are right to regulate it as strictly as you do. Um, and the evidence for that was published in the Lancet uh, Medical Journal in 2007, or is it 2010, by Professor David Nutt and others. And it's a very, very comprehensive, detailed study yeah. of comparative harms. We've talked about that study here, I think, on this podcast. I'm going to go drink today, actually. And I'm going to have more than a few. And it's crazy that I don't get moralized for that in the same way. <laughs> it's pretty insane. Yeah, it is. It is because um, your behavior on alcohol is more likely. Now, I, I, I suspect you're a very composed and sociable yeah. smiley drinker, but uh, the average person, your behavior is far more likely to become objectionable mm. on alcohol than any other drug. Mm. And people demonize cocaine saying it changes behavior. Nah, not, not like alcohol. And actually... Most people, where, po where people have a behavioural problem with cocaine, it's because they're mixing it with alcohol, hmm. which is a really bad idea. Um, but of course, we don't we don't get that harm reduction advice out there. But we would be having that harm reduction advice out there if it was a controlled commodity. Yeah. Any thoughts, Samuel? Uh, many thoughts. <laughs> many thoughts. <laughs> uh, no, I'm just I'm listening and. Uh, um, and we're we're making a good argument here for let's say what good would legalization do, especially when you regulate it and so forth. And I'm thinking on the other side of like there there seems to be a lot of people who oppose still. Yeah. Uh, even though hearing good arguments, okay, or we could save lives. Um, I'm trying to take a step into let's say someone who opposes these yeah. ideas into their shoes. What would you say? Why would someone want to oppose? these kind of thoughts because right now I'm getting an idea that someone who oppo would oppose maybe buys into this maybe some uh, some kind of an ideological idea that drugs are just bad and that's it like th with the war on drugs um, that seemed to be the main idea that we just you know they're bad and we need to fight against them and so forth what kind of what could I expect from someone else's mind who would oppose to what, what would the arguments be for against these ideas. Can I can I phrase your question? Uh, yes, please. Th this is condescending, but can I phrase your question in sure. a way? What's oh. the best argument uh, against your case that you, you have? Well, I mean, th there is no evidence-based <laughs> argument. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I mean, I will I will answer the question. Sure. I will answer the question. No, I'll, I'll just, yeah, we could have arguments, but it's more like, what what is someone thinking when they still want ah. to fight against, against yeah, the yeah, evidence? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So there's a few things going on there. I mean, those people who will never change their minds, who have a sort of dogmatic, near religious belief system, belief in the system as it is, they are coming from a position of moral judgment and that drugs are wrong. And they also believe that with, if we just keep trying a bit harder, a bit harder, if we spend more on the police and then have more police and bigger prison sentences, we can have an, imp we can have an impact. So it's a belief system. But every part, every single part of that belief is counted by the evidence. So we have various reports, including one commissioned by the U UK government in 2014 called the Comparators Report, which actually shows, because it studied drug policy in every country around the world, and that report concluded that no matter the level of punitive action from the state, including the death penalty or life imprisonment, it doesn't have any impact on drug consumption at all. Mm. The evidence is there. And the UK government tried not to publish it, but it was leaked. Um, so the evidence contradicts that that belief system, but it's a belief system and that's difficult. It's really difficult to get people to change on because it's like trying to tell someone that their their belief in God is wrong or, you know. But having said that, those people who are immovable and dogmatic, they're still the minority because actually the majority of politicians, I mean, I'm an, I have an old-fashioned old view of politicians. 
that I, I, I admire them to take on what they do. And most of them will sway and change if they believe that the evidence is there and if they believe public opinion is with them. Now, you could be cynical about that, that they only go where public opinion goes. But that's democracy. That's the way our democracy works. So that's why this issue, it's a social justice issue. And like every social justice issue in history, whether it's gender equality, uh, abortion rights, whether it's um, the illegality of homosexuality, not that long ago, all of those social justice issues changed through social movement rather than political leadership. So most of the politicians will follow the evidence if the public bothers to speak to them about it. They will. And because most of them are good people wanting to do the right thing and finding the best way to do it. Most of them are. So we can win most of them over. Not not the nutters. Forgive me for being really rude about those dogmatic freaks. But most of them will change their mind. Even those people who have taken a firm a firm line. Yeah, there's a there's this disgusting and vile sense in a lot of people uh, who sort of fetishize these type of sort of Duterte regimes, like in the Philippines, where yeah. where drug dealing and even usage sometimes is treated with like street executions and this sort of revenge porn attitude towards drug policy, which is I don't know where that comes from. It's not a healthy place. No, no, absolutely. Um, but you've you've got. And a form of extremism much closer to home here in Finland. And this is important for this region because you could go in two different directions at this point. Mm. You could go on the pragmatic health-based approach to save lives following the evidence, or you could go like Sweden. Yeah. And Sweden is beyond crazy on this topic. In Sweden, they arrest twice as many people for drugs as the next highest in Europe twice as many and they've been doing this and ramping it up and making more laws and locking more people up for a long time now and they're still careering in that direction they've got an extra get tough drug law coming in in june uh, where even the slightest crumb if it's supplied you get six months in prison minimum it's completely insane and contrary to the evidence now that that's a risk because you get influence from the countries around you but Look at what's happened in in Sweden. They have hundreds of explosions. I think they had something like 420 explosions last year yeah, between drug gangs fighting with each other with automatic weapons, grenades, improvised explosives, yeah. entire buildings being blown up with open gang war. Yeah. And it's, let me explain this very clearly. They've caused that by their aggressive drugs policing, by constantly disrupting the market, constantly disrupting, constantly causing those those opportunities and constantly causing conflict between those people trying to make the money from those marketplaces. Yeah. And those Swedish gangs are in charge of the supply into Finland, into Denmark and Norway. Yeah. And the reason that Swedish gangs doing it is because they've the one they've they're the ones who've become ruthless, powerful, violent because of the policy regime in Sweden. This has been caused by their policy. This is really important because in here in Finland we are looking at Swedish crime and connecting it to our own discussion about integrating immigrants, which obviously, oh, which obviously yeah. has, um, I mean, Sweden did not do a good job with that. They, they were very negligent in how, in how they, uh, basically boxed up a bunch of like immigrants and uh, brought them into the country and did not care to, uh, sort of integrate them into society in a way, very arrogant policy towards immigration. I would say and many people would criticize, but this isn't talked about this part, the drug policy, the, the organ, the, the way they, uh, deal with organized crime, which is funded with drug money. Yeah, exactly. This and isn't talked about here. No, and this is the great risk, and this happens all over the world where you have violence from the drug market. It's not the drug. It's not the policy. It's blamed. It's oh. it's minorities. It's not always immigrants. It's it's no. It's Mexican immigrants or it's it's, it's right. people of a different color. It's someone anyway. Someone, and of course, it's made a drastic shift to the far right in terms of the political influence in Sweden as a result of this this problem, and it's all down to their drug policy. It 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 really is. It doesn't take that much unpicking to see why they've got such extreme violence and why this has put pressure on and allowed the far right to take to dominate that narrative. Finland's got a choice here um, in terms of how, how, how these things are dealt with. Yeah. Follow the evidence or follow the crazy because yeah. there's no other way of describing Sweden's drug policy is the crazy. 
This would be a great moment to end, and you have to go at some point. But one more question that I want to sort of direct to the middle ground people who are sort of on the fence on this and who might have some reasonable questions regarding dr drug policy reform. Uh, the other alternative to prohibition uh, is decriminalization. It's, mm. it's something that has been presented as an option in many cases. Obviously, you're not advocating for that. You're advocating for legalization. Yeah. What is the difference and why is decriminalization not sufficient in your mind? Well, decriminalization is still a good idea okay. because no one should be criminalized for what they do with their own mind and body, put quite simply. Yeah. And decriminalization saves lives. The evidence proves that in Portugal. They had the highest drug deaths, now they got the lowest. Why? They decriminalized. But decriminalizing is only decriminalizing the possession of the person who's who's possessing and using the drugs, um, which obviously is good. You save money. Uh, it, it's a, it's a, a money-saving public policy as well. Uh, but I have, to, I have to look at this from a policing perspective because it's still criminals in charge of the supply. So we need to get rid of the criminal, criminal element from the market for all the reasons that, that I've explained. However, we still, as an organisation, of course, we support decriminalisation. And for some places, that's a first, first step. But I'm hoping that in Finland, actually, your first step would be a legal, a legal, uh, well, that that a legal cannabis market would sit alongside a wider decriminalization policy. I'm hoping that that is what will take shape here, so that you can, you know, take control away, some at least some of the controls away from from organized crime. And in fact, there is um there is an uh, an initiative going on in here in Finland, and I can't pronounce it, but there's a there's I can a, help you. Yeah, there's um. If you look it up, I'll, I'll, I'll pronounce it. Yeah, I've, I'll have to just switch my phone and it's on there. Hang on. Um, oh, yeah. But it's an initiative. It's like a petition uh, for the, a legal regulated cannabis market. And if, if you're able to sign that and support it, then you, you can make a difference. Yes. I think you have to, it has to, has to reach 50,000 50, signatures. 000. That's all. Yeah. That's all. It's Cole Thomas, I think, from the Green Party. Uh, he's part that, of that's it? right he's yeah. he's part of the organization so you can find details of it on his website called thomas's website yeah please sign that uh petition and also cole thomas as well i mean there are some really good politicians on this topic and i spoke what spoke alongside one of them at the event this week from the left alliance what was her name um i'm so sorry i forget veronica it. yeah i think Hongos, it. yeah she was great um but also cole thomas is good i mean i knew him already already because he, he connects himself to the international movement. But there's an election in three weeks, is it? Yes. So anyone out there, please vote for people who support drug policy reform. Um, and if you don't live where Cole Thomas lives, then if you know someone who does, then persuade them to vote for Cole or anyone else who is positively supporting drug law reform. Great. Thank you very much, Neil. Thanks for visiting Futurecast. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's really been really good to meet you. Thank you very much. Uh, should I do this English finish? Partly English. Um, this is a, we usually do episodes in, in Finnish, so this has been a rare treat. Maybe we'll do more of these in the future. I hope you enjoyed this, and uh, see you next time. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. Bye-bye.